to the second part of our series on renovating my Amiga 500. So in the first part of the series, we looked at the overall situation. Um, this machine was never really in terrible condition. Uh, everything basically worked when I got it, apart from the, the memory expansion, which had suffered battery damage. That's an easy thing to fix. You can buy uh, trapdoor memory expansions for the Amiga 500 quite readily these days. I actually bought one from Amiga Kit. I think it cost me 16 pounds, something like that. I think it's very good value for money, really. And it has a jumper on it, which allows you to um, set it up to use chip mem. Uh, so that seems to be pretty good. Now, we discussed the fact that I, ha I also wanted to get this um, GVP uh, HD8 Plus hard drive working with it. Um, this is the unit, obviously with a cover off. When I actually bought it, it came with a 64 gigabyte uh, SD card uh, supplied with it, which is quite nice. And um, when I actually tried it, I found that it had an issue. So I want to actually show you that now. So we're going to plug it into the sidecar expansion here. Actually, let me just put my glasses on for fiddly stuff like this up close. The old eyes aren't quite as good as they used to be. Uh, okay, let's get it in position. Just taking care that I don't break things when I do that. We need to have the floppy disk drive plugged in, that's why it's here. We've got the working keyboard. Everything is basically working, it's just the machine is disassembled. Let's turn on the monitor. There we are, I think we're ready to go. Let's turn this on. Power light came on. Let's see what happens. I can see the hard drive light flickering there. The screen's gone gray. So the Amiga's booting up. And I must admit, I've been quite surprised how slow this is. It does seem to take a while to load. I'm not sure why that is, whether it's to do with the initialization of the, the hard disk, the Zulu SCSI, or if it's to do with the actual GVP device itself. But it does take quite a while to boot, even when it's fully working. So we'll just have to be a little bit patient. I'm going to do this in real time. And this is the problem that I have. This disk requires Kickstart version 2.0 and I don't have that kickstart ROM. I have the original ROM, which is a 1.3 kickstart. So the situation is these days that you can't legally use ROMs randomly. Personally, I think you should be able to. I think this is legacy hardware and uh, I think it should be abandoned, well, abandoned where by now, but legally it is not. So you have to have a, uh, a legally licensed ROM. Personally, I think it's okay to burn your own ROMs if you're going to test things, which is something I would like to do. But it turned out that my ROM reader writer, my chip reader writer, uh, was slightly incompatible with an adapter I bought for it. So I'm not able to actually do that right now. But I do have a saving grace, which is that when I was upgrading my Amiga 2000, I bought this ROM and it's a 3.2. And I, I actually was going to use this and then I found out that I didn't actually own Amiga OS 3.2 and I couldn't find anywhere to buy it. So I just parked that plan for a while and I didn't actually use this ROM in the Amiga 2000. It went in a bag and it just went back into my parts box. Now it could be useful because now I think uh, this is obviously greater than two. So maybe this OS could work uh, with this, right? Except that I've tried that out and it doesn't quite work, but we do need to move to this ROM. So let's see what happens when we put it in. So let's turn the machine off. I'm going to use a plastic spudger to get this out, obviously being careful to do this. And it goes, 1.3 kickstart over here, 3.21. Make sure I've got the notch in the right orientation. And uh, make sure I've got the pins lined up nicely. And just put that in with a bit gentle bit of pressure. It's a bit of a crunchy noise as it goes in. It's okay. Okay, it's greater than two. So hopefully now we can boot into whatever was supplied to me on this hard disk. So let's give that a try. Again, it's gonna be quite slow. As I said, it's not the fastest hard drive solution for some reason. To be honest, the speed isn't necessarily the only big feature of moving from one media to another. 
I found that when I went for my Commodore tape-based uh, Commodore 64 to using floppy disks, it was just a, a quantum leap forward because of the organization capability of having floppy disks. You know, the fact that they have uh, directories and you can have multiple files with names, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, there's an issue. So we'll come back to that in a second. But what I found is that when you move from a floppy-based system to a hard disk, you have a similar thing going on. It's not just the increased speed of the hard drive that's good. It's the ability to have more data easily accessible. It's the same thing really as going from tapes to floppy disks except it's another level again. So that's one of the main benefits I'll have with this machine. The fact that I'll be able to have all my software on it, not have to go searching through a disk library just to get a single game. I'll be able to store it on there. Anyway, we have a problem, which is that this ROM actually doesn't have certain libraries on it that this operating system, uh, Workbench 2.0, is trying to load. So I can't use this Workbench with this operating system. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to upgrade this workbench to get it to run with this ROM. What I might do in the long run actually is I might then swap that out at some point with um, a downgraded um, version of this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna keep this. I'm gonna upgrade a copy of this OS and then probably I'm gonna go back to using the 2.0 version of this with a 2.0 ROM once I've purchased one of those. I may burn one in the meantime once my chip writer has arrived to test it out, make sure it works. I think that's a perfectly fine thing to do. And then once you're sure that it works, then you can obviously buy the legit ROM and put it in. And the job is done. So there we are. This is the issue we have. Um, now, this is where the real power of the Zulu SCSI comes in. The Zulu SCSI is based on a number of hard drive files, which are basically virtualized hard drives. And they are literally files, which you can read on a Windows 10 PC or a Mac or something like that. The tools I use run well on Windows, so that's why I use Windows. So what we need to do now is to take this SD card, copy it onto my Windows PC, and then what we need to do is then do a little bit of work in WinUAE, which is a, you know, an Amiga emulator. And that will allow us to set up this machine in emulation. And then once we've done that, we should be able to use it um, on the live machine. So we'll turn this off. We'll take the micro SD card out, which is like I said, a 64 gigabyte uh, drive. And we'll go off now and we'll get this prepped to work with this machine. And um, yeah, there's a few steps to that. So I actually wanted to show that to you in this video. So let's go and do that now. Okay, so I've copied the contents of the SD card onto my Windows PC into a folder called A500 back. I spell it like that. It's just a, a follow on from the DOS days where you could only use three characters for file names, you know, the extensions. So the SD card actually has four hard drive files on it. One, which is four gigabytes and three one gigabyte files, as well as um, this is Zulu SCSI's error file and a log. I want to change this because I'm not really interested in having one gigabyte hard drives. Uh, this is a 64 gigabyte card. I actually have, I think a 16 gigabyte card, which is actually what I'm gonna use for this machine, at least for now. The beauty of using a Zulu SCSI is you can copy these files from this card onto another card and then you know reorganize things as you need. Same thing with the blue SCSI. So what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna back up this backup and then we're gonna mutate that and modify it to make it into the machine that I want to have. So here we are, I've duplicated that directory or rather I made a new directory and I just copied across the hard drive file, the first file. I've also renamed it as well um, to HDA and the reason for that is that Zulu SCSI actually wants to work with files called HDA, not HDF. That's an issue that I found when I was working at this process. You can actually force WinUE to read HDA files. They're exactly the same format as far as I can see as a HDF file, it's just a different extension. But if you don't name it HDA, I find that Zulu SCSI won't actually see the file and mount it. So that's probably best avoided. Now, this is the original OS. And what we need to do with this is actually upgrade it to Workbench 3.2. So we're gonna do that next in WinUAE. So this is WinUAE. It's a free emulator for uh, Windows. A little bit of an aside here, I actually did have an issue with this for a few years. I, I run a multi-monitor setup on my Windows 10 machine. A couple of years ago, there was something strange about the multi-monitor setup and WinUAE, whenever you started it, would appear sort of compressed. You, you couldn't expand the windows properly and it was just completely balked for about, probably about two years really until I changed my configuration recently, bought a new monitor, now it's working again. 
In the meantime, I still had to do things with my Amiga virtually, so I bought uh, Amiga Forever from Cloanto. I actually find that WinUAE is, in my opinion, maybe better because it's very granular and it's a pretty simple interface. I wouldn't say it's simple in that it, you know, it offers a lot of different features, but they're quite easy to understand and work with. So what I've done here, you can see I've got a few other virtual machines, but this is the machine I'm interested in today, Upgrade Chris's Amiga 500. So I'm just going to make sure I load that configuration. And you can make as many configurations as you want in UAE, which is pretty cool. Now this one, because we've just loaded it, we can check out what's in it. It's got a 68030 processor, which is not normal for an Amiga 500. I've done that just to make everything work faster because I'm not really interested in a faithful emulation of my Amiga 500 here. What I'm interested in is doing stuff quickly. Uh, that's one of the big things about WinUAE. You can actually set it up so it does everything super fast. Uh, you see I've got the CPU set to eight. Uh, let's try 16 actually. And we'll just save that. Every time you change something, you must make sure you save it. Chipset is the original chipset. Don't need to change that. Our advanced chipset, the same thing, we don't mind. This matters. WinUAE comes with a bunch of different ROMs and I've actually found this one, Kickstart ROM 3.2 Walker. Turns out that it's a kind of beta, but it does seem to be compatible with Workbench 3.2, so that's good for our purposes. RAM, I've given us more RAM. I've given us one meg of chip, 1.8 meg of slow and eight meg of fast. Floppy drives, none. Let's just give us an empty one actually, uh, that's fine. Uh, CD and hard drive, so this is the bit that we need to do next, we need to set this up. So again, I'm gonna save my configuration because I made some tweaks there. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna set up the uh, hard drive. And to do that, I'm gonna use a hard file because we actually have some hard files which came from the original device. I showed that to you just now. So let's click on add hard file. We need to go to the directory where the hard file is. In this case, it's on my hard drive for now. HDAs, HD0, that's the name that's actually more important for Zulu SCSI. It needs that to mount it as a SCSI device zero. But, and again, HDA is important for Zulu SCSI, but we can still load it in WinUAE, even though it's not one of the sort of standard formats. Um, but it turns out that it looks like HDF files and HDA files are basically the same thing. Or WinUAE supports HDA without actually saying it. I'm not sure which of those is true. We'll just click on open. It's going to do it as a read-write drive and it's going to be bootable. That's fine. And uh, yeah, that's it. So, okay, that. Let's go con to configurations. And the reason why I'm saving it religiously is that every time you start up WinUAE, you start an actual virtual machine, this window will close and the virtual machine window will open and you have to close that window and you effectively lose this session when you do that. So it's quite easy to be a little bit impulsive, click start when you made a change and then you go back and you find that you've lost it. Of course, you might want to do that just to test something out. So in this case, we're just going to make sure this works. So let's, uh, let's start the machine. So it's a beta release, as you can see. So you need to click your mouse button to start booting. Wow, that was fast. <laughs> Not actually seen it boot that quickly before. Okay, well, that's amazing. Um, that should make this tutorial a little bit faster, I think. Okay, and there we are. So we're in a Workbench and uh, everything is great. There's the boot drive. This is actually, these uh, three disks here are actually one device. Um, the, uh, I think it was four gigabyte drive. And it's been partitioned into three partitions, a boot partition, uh, DH1 and DH2. I think in the future I might actually reorganize this because what I like to do is actually sometimes have the Workbench disk as just a, a small disk, like say, something like 512 megabytes or 300 megabytes. It doesn't have to be very big for Workbench. And the reason for that is that it then makes that disk very portable and easy to swap in with other ones. Whereas this is a four gigabyte disk. So if I wanna swap out this boot disk, it's, it's quite a big file to be honest. Um, anyway, let's have a look at the version of uh, Workbench. So this is version uh, 3767. And this is a little bit confusing because we talk about Workbench uh, 1.3, Workbench, two Workbench 3. Internally, Commodore seemed to use a more granular system. Version 3767 is what we know as uh, Workbench 2.04. I think 36 something or other is Workbench 2. Then you have these, obviously, these point releases and they then all get grouped together as one major release of Workbench. That's, that's basically how it goes. So this is showing us that this is a, uh, the second version of Workbench 2. So yeah, that's it. So. Uh, I'm just going to uh, press tab alt to get my mouse out of this window and I'm going to close it and I'm going to go back into WinUAE.
Okay, we're back in WinUAE. We're going to load up our configuration again. We're going to go down to the hard drives again. So what I want to do now is I want to mount a virtual CD-ROM drive, except I'm not going to do it as a CD-ROM drive. I've actually copied the contents of my Amiga OS 3.2 into a folder underneath my uh, retro Amiga stuff. So uh, I can just mount it as a hard file, actually. Well, as a directory. See, that's a feature of WinUAE, which is really cool. So we're going to click on that. The device name is going to be DH20, just because I don't want it to conflict with any lower numbers. And the volume, this is very important, it needs to be Amiga OS 3.2 CD. If you don't do that, it won't actually install, which is a bit of a pain, but there we are. And I've already mounted this previously, so there it is in my history. 3.2, and that's it. Just okay that. And the next thing I want to do is I want to add another hard file. And this is just to show you how you do it in WinUAE. Quite an important process because I need to, in the future, do this again with my SD card, whatever I decide on for this Amiga 500. So it's actually a bit of a workflow you need to learn. So we're gonna say add a hard file. I'm gonna make a quite a small one um, because this is just a demo. I'm not gonna make a real uh, one, but this is just to show you the process of actually making a hard file. So we're gonna click on create. I've Let's make it not bootable. Yeah, let's create that. And we're going to put it in the same folder as the other one. Uh, we're going to call it HD1 uh, HDA. And it's important to remember that this, okay, this is a hard drive, not a partition. So this is like a physical SCSI hard drive or something like that. You can partition this inside Workbench to be smaller, but you've got to bear in mind that there are limitations for each version of Workbench, how big these can be. I need to find out what the limitation is for Workbench 3.2. And then obviously then work out what size SD card I want to use in conjunction with one or more HDA files to use up that space. SCSI is quite a good thing to have because um, you can have, uh, I think, seven devices. So I could obviously have seven separate hard drives if I wanted to, each one up to the maximum lim limit of, you know, basically what Workbench supports. Let's press OK. And it's added. And of course, we've got to go to configuration and save that. We don't want to lose that work. I think that's it, we're ready to go. Let's start up the machine again. Okay, we're booting up into Windows 2. Wow, that's amazingly fast, isn't it? And there's the um, there's the installation CD. Um, it's actually, as I said, a folder, but anyway, it ends up being the same thing. So we're just gonna install this before we actually do anything with a hard drive. So we'll open up the CD, go to the install folder, start here. It's created a sort of virtual uh, floppy disk on the desktop. There we are. Close that, close that. Open up the disk. There it is. And install. And I'm going to install the English British version. Just wait for it to get going. We're going to proceed. Install release 3.2, yeah. We're going to go for intermediate user. Proceed with install, proceed. Yes, proceed. Uh, English language, English, British. Let's go for that. Actually, we'll keep both. Proceed. We'll deselect the printers because we don't need them. Proceed. Bizarrely, it gives you all these different languages for your uh, keyboard, but I obviously don't have all of those. So we'll just go for those two. Proceed. Uh, do we want to use glow icons? Well, this is a pretty low-end machine, right? 68,000, so I don't think it's going to do well with that. So we'll say no. Um, do you want to move things into an old folder? Yes, we do. There we go. And should it automatically delete files? Yes. And we'll let it install. So it's just like asking me which type of machine it is. It's an A500. And it's just warning me here that I've got a 68030 processor. In the real machine, it won't have this. It's asking me to install libraries for it, but yeah, it's irrelevant for us, so we'll just proceed. And installation is complete. There we are. We'll just reboot this just to make sure that everything is uh, completely installed, but I believe it already is. But yeah, we'll just do a quick reboot, make sure that's all good. And here we go. We should be in. Let's have a look. Yeah, 
that's 47, Workbench version 47 is actually Workbench 3.2. I know, it's confusing. So let's clean up the boot directory. It's a bit of a mess right now, post-installation. So we'll just go to Window, Clean Up, Clean Up by Name. And then we'll do um, Snapshot Window and Snapshot All. So let's have a look in the Tools directory. And we'll have a look at a tool called HD Toolbox. So I'm just going to open that up, let it do its thing. And you'll see this is the issue that I found when I, when I was using WinOE with these hard files. Um, as far as it's concerned, there are no hard drives attached to the system, which we know is wrong because it's booting off hard files, right? So we need to make a change for that to work. So the technique I would advocate is to make a duplicate of HD Toolbox because then you can have your, your cake and you can eat it. Copy, and we're gonna rename it to, uh, let's call it HD Toolbox UAE, because that's what it's actually gonna be for. Uh, UAE hard files, there we are, rename that. And to make this, read off different devices, you actually have to go into its info. So go to information and you'll see that it has um, under the icon tab, this thing here, SCSI device name. That actually tells it which driver to use basically. So we need to change that to uh, UAEHF. And I believe that's it. Just save that, load it up again. Now from our copy here, see it's using this driver instead. And now it's found some drives. There we go. So we need to inspect these. I think this is the CD-ROM hard drive file. Anyway, let's look at this one first. We're going to change the drive type. This is something you have to do just to tell it which type of drive it is. It's XT, which is like a PC driver or a SCSI drive. Once you've chosen which type, in this case SCSI, we'll say define new. And we need to read the configuration. And it says it cannot read it. So that's actually the folder. Okay, uh, so let's okay that. Uh, we'll cancel that actually. And let's go to the last one and change the drive type. Again, we'll do the same thing. This looks like it might be it actually. Uh, define new, read the configuration, continue. There we are, 128 megabytes. So that's the file that we made earlier. So we need to uh, say that's okay. And we'll okay again. And now we need to partition this drive. The tool actually uh, breaks drives into two parts by default, but we actually want it to be one in this case, or you could do whatever sort of partition setup you want to do. This tool is a little bit fiddly, but it does the job. There we are. So 128 megabyte, just by dragging that arrow over to use up all the space. I'm going to call it um, device one instead of zero, because the other one is zero, right? Our boot drive. I don't want this to be bootable. That's okay. And then we need to save the, the changes for this. It also says that this has changed and it's probably because it's just inspected it for the first time. We just need to save the changes for that as well. And I think that's it. That's all we need to do is just exit. And now uh, the drive is uninitialized, right? The one that we were just looking at. These don't forget, these are actually on the first hard drive. These are partitions on the first hard drive. So this is our DH1 device. So I'm just gonna go to format the disc. Let's say we wanted to put games on this. I'm gonna say games and fast file system, international mode, there we are. And we're gonna do a quick format. Are you sure? Yes, we are. Are you really, really sure? Yes, we really are sure. And there it is, it's ready to go. And just to show that it actually works, we'll go into boot and I'm gonna copy, let's say the tools directory into here. So let's see what's that like. Boom, there you go. That's how quick it is. I don't think it's gonna be that quick on the real hard drive, but in WinUAE, obviously, because everything's sort of accelerated, it's just super fast. So we can delete that. Yes, we happy wanna get that, get rid of that, close that down. So I think what we should do now is take this SD card back to the real machine and see if it works. Let's do that now. Okay, so I've got the SD card that we put everything onto earlier. I've done a little bit of extra work on this off camera, so I'll show you that to you in a minute. So I'm just gonna put this in here. Put the old glasses on. Pop that in to the Zulu 
SCSI. We'll turn on the machine. We'll just turn on the monitor. There we go. I've got to say, it's not the fastest boot in the world, so I'm not going to do this in real time. We'll actually fast forward through this because it takes, it takes about uh, a minute or something like that to boot up. There we go. So you may notice that we have a few more hard disks here, and there's a reason for that. I did a bit of uh, jiggery-pokery, and I'm going to show you how I did that before I actually do that, though I do need to show you another change. So if we go into the boot disk, we need to open up the tools folder. You'll notice a big difference between the speed here and the speed on WinUE. This is a real machine with, uh, well, it's an emulated hard drive, but it's going through a real controller. There's our UAEF, uh, HF, uh, HD Toolbox, and this is HD Toolbox, the original one. What I want to show you on here is we go to the information again. This does take a while, actually on the real machine. It's quite surprising. Maybe it's the lack of memory, not sure. We'll deal with that in the next video. There we go. Click on icon and you'll see we're using the SCSI device here. So the reason why I point that out is that if you run it, you'll find that you can't actually see the hard drives. It'll do a, a big scan. It'll go through the process of doing the scan, but it's not actually gonna find anything. And the reason for that is, for this device, we need to use its own specific driver, which is GVP SCSI. So let's just wait for that to finish. No hard drives again, which we know is not true. So we're gonna make that modification. We'll just do it directly to this one. We can always change it another time. We'll just open up information again. And we need to go here and edit this. Just need to put uh, GVP, Great Value Pro Products, save that. And now if we run the tool again, it's now going to look through the GVP SCSI devices, which is what these hard drives show up as. So let's just wait for it to do the scan. Okay, so now we have four hard drives. They're all Zulu SCSI hard drives, as you can see. This one, I believe, is the first drive, the boot drive. So let's have a look at that, the partitions on it. And so what I found was when I had a look at this, it's a four gigabyte drive in total, and we had three partitions on it. We had a boot partition, we had a, um, I think it was games A or A drive and B drive, and it was basically split down the middle here for the last part of the data on here. That just seemed to be wasteful to me. It would make more sense to me to actually just make that into as big a drive as possible. And what I'll probably do in the future is I'll make another version of this where I reduce this right down to say 300 megabytes, and then the rest of the space will be for one drive, let's say for games or applications or something like that. So that's that disk. Then the other three disks then, they are separate hard drive files, HDA, uh, sorry, HD1, HD2, and HD3. And each one of these is actually just set up to be the full partition size. As you can see there, 3876 megabytes in size. And yeah, so that gives you basically uh, what appears to be five hard disks. Well, it's five partitions. You've got boot on zero, and then you've got uh, games uh, B on the second drive, C and D, and games A is on the first drive. So let's exit out of there. Yeah, so I'll just go over that again. Boot is one gigabyte basically from the first hard drive. Games A is also on the first hard drive and it's a, I think it's a, like a two, two and a bit uh, gigabytes partition. Uh, this is close to being a four gigabyte partition, four and four. And this then uses up pretty much the 16 gigabytes, which is on this SD card. As I said, you notice quite a lot of uh, speed difference between the emulated machine and this Amiga, which makes perfect sense, right? This is a, a very old machine, uh, but it runs perfectly fine. In the future, I think I would probably try to go back from using Workbench 3.2. Maybe it's a little bit heavy uh, for this uh, sort of age of hardware. Uh, I'll check online and see what other people think about that. But it's basically working for now, right? So what is remaining to do on this machine? Well. 
the amount of chip RAM is pretty tiddly. It's um, less than uh, 512K. Obviously, once the OS boots up, uh, it loses a little bit of it to the OS. If I was to use the glow icons, which we saw earlier in the installation of 3.2, we would actually lost a lot of chip RAM because it gets used up uh, displaying the icons. The hard drive itself is fine. It's got two megabytes in it. I think we want to expand that in the future to eight. Uh, these are one megabyte sticks. So if I keep those, I'd only be limited to four. So I may actually just take those out and buy another four two megabyte sticks. Hopefully eBay won't be too punishing on me with those. These days, the prices of a lot of retro stuff, you know, the prices just keep on spiraling up. The machine is ready to go in terms of the RAM. So we'll do that in the next uh, episode, but I think that's it for now. This hard drive is working. We've got some files on here. In the future, obviously, we need to put some content into these different uh, folders, uh, hard drives, I should say, and um, you know, make use of this machine. So yeah, that's it, I think, for this video. And obviously, if you liked it, then please you know, click on the like button because it really helps this video to get out to other people. It will help YouTube to recommend it to other people. Another thing you could do to help my channel, if you could, is to recommend this over WhatsApp. If you have any friends, just send them the link because um, I found that's actually quite effective. And obviously, if you do like this video and you would like to see more, please subscribe to the channel. And uh, hopefully, we'll see you back for part three in this series and obviously more videos from the Retronaut. That's it for now. I'll see you in part three, hopefully. And uh, until then, take care.